So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are God, the maker of heaven and earth. I thank you, Lord, that you're the sustainer of the universe. You're our sustainer. Who of us wouldn't admit that there's been things we've been through that in our own strength and in our own will, we never could have survived, or we'd never have a day of joy, much less glee. Father, I thank you, Lord, that people are, are sacrificing their life here on this earth, for no one sacrificed like you did. And you still, Lord, help us in so, so many ways. And you invite us one day to be in your kingdom forever and ever, where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more stress of any kind. No one needs a hospital. No one needs to have food. Everything is taken care of, Lord. But Father, as we're down here, you've put us on a mission assignment, a mission assignment to go deeper than sometimes what we tell ourselves, a mission assignment where you're number one, mission assignment where we really need to test you and try you, just as the scripture said, and see if you're not God. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would really focus today away from the world for a little while. We want to be involved in the world, but we want to be ready to be in the world so that we can be equipped to be able to talk and share and, and just, just be able to talk in a way that people hear how Jesus can make a difference in our lives because they see that Jesus has made a difference in us. Oh, Lord. I pray for your spirit just to speak to us all right now, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If we go back a few years, and it was probably a long time, I can't remember exactly how long it was, there was a church, and it was a beautiful church, and they always wanted to have something very special when it came to Christmas time. So when it came to Christmas time, what they decided to do is put out all kinds of things that people would love to see. So there were poinsettias all over the place in the church, and there were golden bells all over the place, and there was a candle sill on every window that was there in the church. And in the midst of all the beauty, the choir would get up and they would present what was known as a cantata back in those days, where they would just sing throughout the whole service. They wanted a special... They wanted to capture this special time in a very special way, and so the pastor went up to one of his friends and he said, hey, we want to be able to take a film of this so we can remember everything that happened. And his friend said, I'll be glad to do that. Let me study the room for a little while, and after I study the room for a little while, then I'll decide where I need to put my video equipment. So he studied the room, and then he said to himself, you know what, this is the perfect place right next to the window. Well, about 15 minutes into the service when they were taping it, the cameraman did something he didn't expect to do. He leaned too close to the lighted candle, and when he did that, his suit coat caught on fire. The flame was snuffed out right away, and thankfully no one was hurt. But when talking about what happened, the praise team leader said, finally, someone is on fire in the name of the Lord in this church. <laughs> Now, in Nehemiah chapter 8, what did we see? We saw that the children of Israel were on fire for the Lord too. You remember what happened. All the people gathered together. There were no exceptions to this rule. And when they did, they went up to a man named Ezra. He was a scribe. He was a priest. He was a scholar. And they said, bring out the law of Moses. And if you're not familiar with the law of Moses, it's the Torah. It's the Pentateuch. It's the first five books of the Bible. And when he brought that book out, what did he do? He read aloud from daybreak to noon. He read aloud for six hours. And what does the Bible tell us happened when, they, when he did that? All the people who had gathered together stood to their feet and they listened attentively. They really wanted to hear what was being shared. These folks hadn't heard the word of God taught in a long time and they were very hungry for it. They knew what you and I know every time we open up the scriptures and we read the scriptures with not just our words but we read with our heart. What do we see? We get to hear the mind of God being revealed and the heart of God being heard. After that, what did Ezra do? He praised the Lord, and in response to him praising the Lord, do you remember how the people acted? They lifted up their hands, and they said, Amen and Amen. The word Amen means that's right. It means that's true. And then after doing that, what did they do? They bowed down and they worshipped with their faces to the ground. That is a lot. If that's all that they did, it would be much. But it didn't end there. If you remember what took place, next thing they did was weep. They took God's word in, and the more they took God's word in, the more it moved them to have an experience where they had a happy hallelujah, but it didn't stop there. They also had a holy hush. They went from singing out loud to bowing down low because they recognized who God was and what they could do through his strength and through his power. Yes, it was a time of weeping, but they didn't have to weep forever and neither do you 
and neither do I. Why? It's because the very words that were wounding them led them to something beautiful. It led them to conviction. And what did conviction lead them to? It led them to repentance. And what did repentance lead them to? It led them to joy. And what did we see a few weeks ago? What is our strength? It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. It's such a good day in our lives when we recognize our strength is not found in our personalities. It's such a good day when we recognize that our strength is not found in our giftedness. It's such a good day when we recognize our strength is not found in our position. It's such a good day when we recognize our strength is not found in our possessions. What is the source of our strength? It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. What happened after that? You'd think that would be the end, but it's not. They took another step. Do you remember what happened? A smaller group gathered the very next day, and they said, we want to go even deeper than what we went the day before. And when they did go deeper into the Scriptures, they discovered something awesome. They discovered they were living during the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles of Booths, which commemorated the exodus from Egypt. And in response to that, they gathered up all these branches and they built booths and they stated them. They stated them on the rooftops of their homes for seven strays days as they shared with their children how God had guided them and guarded for them and in protecting them by giving them everything they needed, including providing water in the desert. What a special time. What a joyful time. The children of Israel at this particular moment were growing in the Lord. But here's the question. And it wasn't just a question for them. It's the question for all of us who follow Christ. What about you and what about me? Were they continuing to grow in the Lord? Would their joy remain? What would they do after shouting amen? It's so easy to get up and pray a passionate prayer of confession. But quite another thing to go on and live an obedient life. Did they continue to experience renewal? Did they continue to experience revival? If so, how did they guard their hearts? And the tendency that all of us have to drift, to drift. Well, the last time we were together in chapter 9, we saw the people position themselves to live out their amens. And how did they do that? They came together with something very important. You sure don't hear about it much, and it's certainly not valued the way that it should be. They came together with humble hearts. Wouldn't the world and our personal worlds be better if we had and more people had humble hearts. How, well, how, how humble were they? Well, you remember what we talked about? They fasted. What else did they do? They wore sackcloth. What else did they do? They did something we don't see too much at all today. They put dust on their heads. Talk about the power of humility. Now, why is humility so important? Why is humility so necessary? Let me answer that question. Their humility gave birth to a teachable spirit. If you're not humble, you don't have very much of a teachable spirit. If you think you can do it all, you really don't learn anything new. And when they were, gave birth to a, to a teachable spirit, what did that do? It gave them a deeper understanding of God's Word. And after hearing a deeper thing, teaching from God's Word, what did they do? They started confessing their sin and praising the Lord for His greatness and His goodness because they remembered who the Lord really is and all He had done for them. People say to me sometimes when I'm taking my prayer walks because I'm out there for about an hour and a half, they say, what in the world do you talk about? I can go out there for 10 hours. I just can't walk that far. But I talk to the Lord about all the things He's done for me, all the things I want to do, all the things I hope to, to accomplish in His name, and just want to grow deeper and deeper in my walk with Him. Now, to demonstrate that their commitment was more than just empty words and an emotional experience, what else did they do? They took a very specific action. We saw that back in chapter 9, verse 38, which tells us what they did, saying, In view of all this, when we read the words, in view of all of this, what does it mean? In view of all the past sins and all those of their ancestors and the many blessings that God had provided them time and again, they said, We are making a binding agreement, not just an agreement, a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, the Levites and our priests, are fixing their seals to it. Wow. How did they demonstrate their commitment? They made a binding agreement or covenant with God. Now, you don't hear the word covenant too much anymore, but if you look it up in the Bible dictionary, you'll see that it means a strict promise, a strict promise. Interestingly, in the original language of the Old Testament, the Hebrew, the word used right here is not the one most people think about when it comes to making a covenant. The term that's used right here when you see the word covenant, it literally means to cut. This commitment, this promise to the Lord, was so significant that an animal would be cut. 
an animal would be sacrificed to show how serious they were about this promise. Clearly, this promise was not something they took lightly. Clearly, it was something that was not only costly, but very costly. And that leads us to a very important lesson that I feel led to share with you. And the lesson is this. If we really want to change, don't minimize the power of the word really. If we really want to change, if we really want to make a commitment to God that sticks in his binding, we have to begin by making the desire to really change become real. You hear that again? If we really want to make a commitment to God that sticks, that's binding, we have to make a serious desire to change. All of us know that's true. If we're not serious in our desire to change, it's not going to happen. Simply stated, if we want the hand of God's blessings in our lives, it's going to require us to do what? It's going to require us to make some sacrifices. If we really want God's blessings in our lives, it's going to require us to do some things in His name, not just for ourselves, but for other people. The children of Israel didn't just utter empty words. They put their promise on paper. They wrote their covenant out. They wanted to make sure it was recorded, not just for them, but they wanted to make sure it was recorded for all those who came after them. Talk about a blessing. And then they took another step. The scripture tells us that the leaders, the Levites and the priests, they fixed their seal on it. In the first 27 verses of chapter 10, a long list of names is cited of those who signed and sealed the covenant. And when I read those words, I thought, I don't know if I can pronounce them all for everybody, but maybe nobody knows how to pronounce them all either. But this much I do know, those words on there remind us that the people who did these things are real people. They are real people, and they know exactly what we know. We are far more apt to be successful in our spiritual journey when we have a trusted brother or sister who does something precious for us. And I'll tell you what it is. They hold us accountable. It's so important to have someone in your life who's a Christian, who shares your values, who shares your faith, who will hold you accountable. Now, you hardly ever hear the word accountable these days. It means to give an account. It means to give an honest account to someone else for our choices, for our attitudes, for our actions. Being accountable is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Strength. It's a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of maturity. A wise person once said these words, accountability breeds responsibility. That's true, isn't it? Joe Dumars, if you're a person who follows sports, you probably remember Joe Dumars. He was a former basketball star, star, and when he was talking about accountability, he said, on good teams, coaches hold players accountable, but on great teams, players hold players accountable. And what is true for the game of basketball is even more true for the game of life. We need to be accountable, not just to God, although he needs to be first. We need to be accountable to each other if we truly desire to be healthy physically truly desire to be healthy emotionally, and that's especially true when it comes to being healthy spiritually. I want to chase this one for a while because the Lord just put this in my heart so deeply. David talked about this. Keep your place in Nehemiah, but go with me, if you will, to Psalms chapter 32. Psalms chapter 32. What are we talking about? We're talking about being accountable, not just to God, but being accountable to a, a brother or a sister in his name. Be accountable. Why is that so important? Well, look what we read about what David had to say in Psalms chapter 32, verse 3. He said, when I kept silent, what's he saying? When I tried to handle everything myself, when I tried not to think about the things I didn't think, want to think about, when I tried not to do the things I didn't want to do, he said, when I kept silent, what happened to him? My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Wow. Those words don't surprise me. Because it's not God's intention for us to try to handle everything on our own. Well, as I was thinking about that, and another, another scripture came into my mind and heart that I want you to see. Go with me, if you will, over to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. And in Proverbs chapter 27, look with me at verse 17. Most of you are probably familiar with it. It says, as iron shapes iron, so one man or one person sharpens another. Well, that's not a hard one to understand, and it's certainly true. We can be better together than we can be alone. And that's what accountability, willing accountability, brings about. It makes a person better. 
It makes a person better to be accountable. Now Solomon had something to say about this truth, and I want you to see his words too. So go with me if you will to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Solomon's very upfront when he writes these words. He says, two are better than one. Then he tells us why. Why are two better than one? Well, look how the verse continues. For they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend, important word, can help him up. But pity, cry for, hurt for, pity. Man, the person who falls and has no one to help him up. One more scripture, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Wounds. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. A real friend sometimes will wound you, not because they're trying to hurt you, because they're trying to protect you. They're trying to look out for you. They're trying to see you become all you can be in the name of the Lord. So here's the question. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have a friend who cares more about you than how you perceive, how they perceive you at that particular time when you're struggling and when you're in despair? Do you have a friend like that? Are you a friend like that to other people? Do you have someone who you trust in your everyday life who cares enough when it's necessary to wound you, speak truth to you, when it's necessary to ask some real hard questions because they really genuinely care about you. They don't speak because they think they know it all. Nobody knows it all. They don't speak because they think they're perfect. Anyone who thinks they're perfect is as imperfect as I guess you can get. They speak, why? They speak because they care. They, they care more about you than they worry about how you perceive them in your worst moments. That's what a real friend does. You know what I mean? When you're drifting, they call you on it. When you're making bad choices, they challenge you. When you're grumbling and complaining and making excuses or refusing to see the forest for the tree, they seek to protect you, not only from others, but also from yourself, as they remind you of who you are as a Christian in Christ and who you said you really wanted to be. Let me be personal and let me be probing. Who are your real friends? Let me answer that question. Those are the people who challenge you to be in the Word and live out what the Word teaches. They are the ones who challenge you to be more like Christ in your actions and in your attitudes. Can we go deeper? I hope we can. A lot deeper? I hope we can. Who are your real friends? They are the ones you are willing to confess your sins to, just like it says in James chapter 5, verse 16. And after confessing your sins to them, pray together so you can be what? so you can be healed. Now you may be thinking, and I can understand if you think this, if you haven't thought this all the way through, you may be thinking, who would be willing to do all that? Who would be willing to do all that? I don't know anybody who would be willing to do all that. Well, let me answer that question. Who would be willing to do all that? That's an honest question. It deserves an honest answer. Who would be willing to do all that? The people who really want to change. The people who really want to change. And the people who really want to see you and help you change too. The ones who want their spiritual roots to grow deep, very deep, and come to their fullness in Christ. So let me ask you a question. Who are your best friends? They are the ones who really know you and care enough to ask, what is blocking your growth in Christ and what are you doing about it? What is weighing you down and what are you doing about it? How are your relationships with your family members? How are your relationships with your friends? What are you doing to try to make these things better? How are you doing on your job? Are you working as unto the Lord or are you just simply putting time in? How can I hold you accountable to move forward and live in victory rather than live in defeat? Those questions at times, boy, believe me, I've got some people in my life who play those roles and I'm very grateful for them. I wouldn't trade them for anybody. Those questions, sometimes they wound us. And sometimes they wound us deeply, but they are faithful wounds. They are necessary wounds, and they are signs of genuine friendship when we have someone like that in our life. But there's something else we need to notice about this list of names, and I want you to see what it is. Look at Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 1, the first part of it, where we read these words. Those who sealed it were Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hekeliah. Now, who was the first person who signed and sealed this covenant? Whose name is on the list at the top? It was Nehemiah. And what was his role? He was the one who built the wall, but he also was the governor. That's significant. It's a sign of a real 
leader. There's a lot of people who want to be a leader, but they don't necessarily even know what the word leader really means. What do we know about this man? We know he didn't wait for anyone else to sign. He led the way. Why is that so important? Well, let me tell you why that's so important. Listen to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. He says, a student is not above his teacher, but everyone, pretty inclusive word, right? No exceptions. Everyone who is fully trained would be like his teacher. Boy, do I know as a preacher, I need to be careful. One of the reasons I go by Pastor Ron is it sometimes brings comfort to people who are getting ready to go to heaven. Sometimes some people are fighting real bad. If Pastor Ron is there, they're a little better when they come to try to look towards a solution. But when people say to me, Pastor Ron, boy, do I need to remember I need to be who I'm saying I want to be. It's so important to recognize this. These words should be humbling and convicting. What are they speaking about? They're speaking about the power of influence. Let me tell you something about godly leadership. Godly leaders don't just have a title, they live out a testimony. They strive to absorb the scriptures so they can take people to where God is taking them. And that should not surprise us, because if you aren't going anywhere or growing in the Lord, you can't take anyone else with you to a better place, regardless of your title and regardless of your talent. You see me. When I come in here early, I get here about 7 o'clock when Stephanie's playing the piano. If you saw me, four, about four, Stephanie gets up at 4.15. I will confess I don't do that. But I do get up before 5 because it's hard for me to see her walking around on Sunday morning at 4.15 and not think I need to get up by 5. But believe me, I am praying, praying, praying. Every morning I start in prayer for a long time. Every morning I'm reading the Bible. I've been doing that for the better part of 50 years and I'm so very grateful. But when you see me walking around here, let me tell you, what I'm doing is praying I'm asking, Lord, not just, Lord, not just, what do you want me to share with other people? I'll tell you what else I'm asking the Lord, and I ask this first before I ask, what do I share with those who've been entrusted to me? I say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? And am I genuinely living these things I'm declaring for everyone else to hear? If I don't continue to grow in the Lord and live out these truths that I proclaim, I have nothing of value to share with anyone else, and neither does anyone else. Nehemiah must have been living out the Lord's truth because his life in chapter 10, verses 2 through 27, made a difference. If you read those verses, you'll see that 83 other people followed his example and they signed and sealed the document as well. Well, what happened after that? Look at chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring people for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives, all their sons, their daughters, who were able to understand all these now join their brothers, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our Lord, do you see what I do in these verses? Everyone who was able to understand openly made an oath. They said it out loud. They made a promise, the promise to follow the law of God. In other words, they committed themselves publicly to the authority of God's word. That's significant, and it's not just significant. It's important to recognize the power of that truth. It's important to remember the power of that truth, and it's important to live that truth out. Let me chase that a little bit. Making a public commitment about our dedication to the Lord is an important thing. And not only that, it's biblical. It has tremendous power. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, we do well to tell other people that we have made that decision. It's good for us to share that decision with them, and it's good for us to hear us say those words out loud. When we're baptized, it's not a sign of just identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, but we're telling other people we are serious about our commitment. The old in us has died, and we've been buried, but now we've been raised to walk in newness of life. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's a personal act, but it's also a public declaration of a covenant we've made with the Lord. When we drift, what do we do well? to do, we do well to make a recommitment and let other people know that is what we are doing. Making a public commitment to the Lord not only proclaims to all those around, I am not a silent Christian or a secret Christian, but it also does something else. It reminds us who we are 
and here this one, and it reminds us who we said we really wanted to be. And who are to be the primary recipients of this proclamation? Well, let me answer that. Those who are closest to us. Who's the hardest people to minister to? Those who are closest to us. Who did Jesus have the most trouble with? His family. His brothers. His sisters. Loved ones. The family. Look with me at verse 30. It says, We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to people around us or take our daughters for our sons. Now this action has nothing to do with ethnicity at all. What is this action talking about? It's talking about what to do with your spiritual lives. Let's make this one personal. Christian mom and dads and grandparents, listen closely to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. These are key words, especially if you're a student of the Bible, you see what the Bible says is going to happen towards the end of the days, and we are moving more rapidly toward that time all the time. Listen to the Bible. Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. How can anyone, pretty powerful word, right? Pretty inclusive. How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he ties up, he first ties up the strong man. Then, after tying up the strong man, what's it say after that? He can rob his house. Let's make this one personal. Christian parents and grandparents, we are to be like the strong man in the Bible. We are called to protect our children and our grandchildren from the evil one who really is walking around like a lion seeking to those who we can devour. And how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of ways we can do that, but we can pray for our children and grandchildren. I pray for our children and grandchildren even before they were born. As soon as I hear somebody in the church is pregnant, I start praying for their children to become a Christian right from the beginning. But then you keep praying for them every single day after that. We're to pray a lot of different things, but one of the things that we're to pray is they're going to continue to grow in their understanding and dedication to the Lord. And we are to endeavor to teach them and train them in righteousness. You say, well, I don't even know where to begin. What are some tools that you can recommend? Well, there are a lot of good devotional books. If you want me to bring some with me next week, I will, that speak especially to the hearts of children. There's a lot of great devotional books that you can read, especially right before they go to sleep. And you can have prayer times together. I remember when our daughters were growing up, if, if we would have a lot that we would pray about, and we'd have a lot of ways we'd do it. Back in those days, you had church directories, everybody's picture, and it's a different kind of a time now. But we would, every time we gathered together for a meal, we would go to the next person on our list in the directory, and we'd pray for that family. Whenever we'd get Christmas cards, we'd pray for that family. Whenever someone was in a hospital, we'd pray for that family. Whenever there was a prayer list, we have 95 people, 95 people on our prayer team, and we pass out a list. If you want one, we can get one to you. We pass them out every Thursday. You can pray for them. There's a lot of different ways to pray, but that's not the only thing you can do. You can purchase a little thing called Love Notes for Kids, where, you sh where it shares not only your love for them, but Christ's love for them and their value to them. I think that's a great thing to do. And then you can also get a book. You know, Stephanie's been better at this than me, but she's better than most things than I am. And in this, it asks a lot of questions. And as you ask these lot of questions, it gives you the opportunity to share some of the most precious memories you hold in your heart, in the nearest and dearest part of your heart. It begins really easy. One of the first questions that's asked is this, describe your childhood home. Well, it's really easy to read about that, and they probably haven't heard that much about it if they've never seen it or whatever else. So you do that page. Then it says, talk about your nickname. I'm not gonna tell you my nickname. You'd be calling me that for the rest of time. No, Jim, I'm not gonna tell you either, okay? <laughs> it says, what was your favorite activity as a child? Well, mine was baseball, I'll say that, okay? But then it gets into a lot of other things, including where and when did you become a Christian? So many children don't even know when their parents made that decision. Where and when were you baptized and why were you baptized? How has your life been changed since you met Christ? What do you want as a spiritual legacy that you leave behind? You tell them your testimony. You tell them how you came to the Lord and how he's changed and continues to change your life. I've been a pastor a long time. You all know that. Close to 50 years. Very grateful for that. One of the things I did a number of years ago, I told myself to do a lot longer than that, is to write down everything I want my family to know if something happens to me. And if you open it, you know it's written for me, because it says if you're reading this book and you know me at all, you know I'm the place I've talked about forever. 
I'm in heaven, don't worry about me. Here's some things you need to do. And it talks about some of the things that need to be done to take care of the family. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't end there. It goes on after that to share the things that are the deepest truths I've learned in the scripture and how I've been able to experience the power of God in, in many, many ways. But that's not the only thing you can do. A couple of years ago, I remember Michael Capito was helping us and we had a Christian parenting class and we all walked away from that thinking, boy, is that powerful. You can take your family to Christian family camps and retreats. A whole bunch of our people just came back from Spruce Lake just this week. You can bring your children to church every week to worship and to learn together and be with other Christian family and their children who have the same objective. But here's the most, here's the most impactful thing you can do. You can live out your commitments to the Lord before them. You can show them the difference that Jesus made in you in your choices in life, in your actions in life, and here's the most important one, in your attitudes in life, so that they will desire to follow your example. You can show them what a Christian family actually looked like and know its values and benefits and establish one of their own someday. Let them witness, let them see, let them hear the specific differences in the way you as an individual and as a family choose to live your life in comparison to this world. That's what the children of Israel did. Look with me about what Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 31 tells us. It says, When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or any other holy day. Every seventh year we will forgo working on the land and will cancel how many debts? All debts. Not some debts, not many debts, not most debts, but all debts. Question. How did they show the difference to themselves and to their children? Well, they did it a lot of ways, but one of the ways they did it was this. We're not going to do business or buy or sell on the Sabbath or any other holy day. Boy, I can remember when I'd come to Ocean City when I was a little boy. I've been coming here all my life. I've only missed one summer. Ever than that, I've been here. So my mother said when she was pregnant with me, she was drinking coffee and eating licorice and walking the boardwalk. I said, that's my favorite thing, drinking coffee and eating licorice and walking on the boardwalk. <laughs> but you know what? Back in those days, you didn't go into any store. On Sunday, you didn't go anywhere. You didn't have the TV on or anything else. We just sat in quiet and just looked at each other and did some talking that we needed to do on other days. And finally, they opened up. Remember, the, you, what the blue laws? Remember the old blue laws where you could go in, but you couldn't buy anything that you had to cook? How times have changed. How times have changed. But they say this, that we're going to treat the Sabbath day. I like to say the Lord's Day because it is the Lord's Day. You don't hear that expression much anymore. And any other holy day, they treated the other days different than any other day. What a powerful witness that must have been to the children. I, when I grew up, I never remember saying to my parents, we're going to church this week. It was just a question, was they going to be ready to get out the door when they said it was time? Well, how else did they show the difference to themselves and to the children? They did something else that's pretty powerful. They let their land rest every seven years. Wow. Wow. But did it stop there? No. What else did they do? They canceled all debt. Talk about an act of faith and a faith builder. They trusted that if they lived according to the word of God, he would provide. They were demonstrating in their everyday life that where God does guide, he does provide. That's what it means to walk in newness of life. How else did they show the difference in themselves and to their children? They were determined not to neglect the house of the Lord. Now, in verses 32 through 36, we're told of specific plans the children of Israel made to take care of the house of God and its ministry. If you read those passages, you'll see this very clearly. They willingly gave of their time, they willingly gave of their talents, and they willingly gave of their tithe to the work of the Lord. And you can be sure that it marked them and it marked their children. Because of Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection, we no longer have to do some of the things that they did. We don't need to offer grain offerings or burn offerings to make atonement for our sin. All that was accomplished by Jesus. And amen to that and amen to Jesus. And because of Jesus, our lives can be changed. They can be changed a whole lot more than what we tell ourselves and what we tell each other. They can be truly changed. We don't have to walk around being a moaner and a groaner. I don't mind if people say that I'm silly. I don't mind if people think I'm a little goofy. I know all those things are true. But I don't want people to think I'm a moaner or a groaner. That would be just such a tragedy. We don't have to be a worry wart 
The one who's always making excuses. I don't want that to be the case for me either. We don't have to look back all the time. So many people, it's a wonder they can walk forward because they're always looking backward. We can do what if we know the Lord and we walk strong with the Lord? We can look up. Look up to who? Look up to God. And we can be set free and live a life of victory and have what be our strength? Our personalities? No. Our giftedness? No. The joy of the Lord be our strength. Let me tell you, I've been through some hard times. And I know you have too. But what's helped me in those times is not me just trying to muster it up from inside myself, but letting the joy of the Lord be my strength. Now think with me about what we've seen in Nehemiah chapter 10. If we want to be changed and stay that way, what do we need to do? We need to remember who God is and everything that we can about what he's done for us. Making that choice would help us. Making that choice would help us a lot. When I'm walking on my prayer walks, I look around and I try to think about everything that I can that God has done. A lot of times I go home and write it all down. We do well to be accountable. Be accountable to someone who will hold us to it, to be in God's Word and live it out. If we did that, it would raise the bar, wouldn't it? We need to make our decision to live for Jesus public to all we know, but we are especially to do that with who? with our loved ones, with our family, with our friends. That choice not only marks us, make no mistake about it, it will mark them. And if we want to be changed and truly stay that way, what do we have to do? We have to give God His day. And we have to remind ourselves and others that where God guides, He also provides. But we cannot stop there. What else do we see in this particular passage? We need to give the Lord our time. We need to give the Lord our talent. We need to give the Lord our tithe. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? I'm saying we need to give the Lord our all. Well, Pastor Ron, that's a lot. That is a lot, and it is costly. I agree. Making a decision to be godly is hard. I would never say it's not. Making a decision to be godly is hard, and it does require sacrifices. I'm never going to deny that. There's no doubt about that. Let me tell you something I've seen over and over and over again through decades of ministry. But making the decision to be godly is worthy and worth it. So many people, they don't know how deep they can go. They don't know the strength they can have. They don't know the joy that can be out there because they don't ever go deep. They just go long, but they don't go deep. And there's no doubt about that. Making the choice to be godly is worthy and worth it. It doesn't mean that you never laugh. It doesn't mean you never make makes mistakes. It just means he's your first priority. And when he says it becomes your marching orders. Down deep in our hearts, all of us know that's true, don't we? We know that living a godly life is not easy and it requires sacrifices. But it's certainly what? It's certainly worthy. And it's certainly worth it. And as I was working on this sermon, over and over and over again, the Lord said those words to me. I said, Lord, what do I entitle this? There's so much in this chapter. There's so much in there all the time. And he said, I mean, it's easy for this one to be figured out, isn't it? It's worthy. And it's worth it. It's worthy. And it's worth it. Here again, the words of the Bible. Test me and try me and see if I'm not be God. It's worthy and it's worth it not just when you get to heaven. It's worthy and worth it when you're here. Your life changes, and all of us are not only better off, those who come behind us are so much better off, too. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we've been able to read about people who lived thousands of years ago, who when they heard the word, they stood up, and didn't just stand up on their feet, they stood up in their heart. And they looked into their hearts and saw the changes that needed to be made. And I'm sure it was hard for them to recognize and confess all the different things they needed to. But when they did, Lord, they started to say amen and amen. They started to sing, they started to cry, started to have joy like they never knew before. Father, it's so easy just to go a few steps with you. It's so easy to say, well, I'm a Christian. I've asked Jesus in my life. I was baptized. I, I've been a Christian for a really long time. But Father, we don't want to just say we have a heritage. We want to say that we're still living out a commitment. 
Father, I pray today, Lord, as we're reminded of the, the, of the great ministry that goes on in Camden and Kensington, Father, that we too need ministry. Need ministry from friends to us, us to friends. And Father, we know that we have an obligation to other people in this world. Father, help us to go deep. Help us to recognize what's really worthy and what's really worth it and where should we should make our first priority. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.